All right, welcome everybody to Derek's discussions Here with my guest Jacob. Uh, Jacob's from Marist College, where I go to school. He's a senior. He's going to be a senior there. So, first of all, how are you doing today, Jacob? I'm doing good, Derek. I'm glad to be here, and thank you for having me. I can't wait to break some stuff down with you. And this is episode two, folks. So obviously, you guys probably saw episode one that was with Ian Nicholas, but we're on episode two right now. So. Jacob, what would you say is your biggest motivation? Like, what is your why? Like, why do you, why are you pursuing a, like sports communication at Marist? Hmm, that's a good question. I would say because it, for one, it's just, it's something I'm passionate about. I've been passionate about sports for a very long time. And I love talking about sports. I love writing about sports. I love sharing my opinion. I love, you know, just having a dialogue about sports. It just, it, I just love it. And it's something that I want to do with my life because I think I could be good at it. And yeah, yeah, that's the best way I can describe it. And then how did, how did COVID impact you? And then how did in, uh, COVID impact you like with the sports world? I would say COVID impacted me from the standpoint that it was just tough to, you know, just like one, like, you know, the whole world changed. Everything was out of whack you, you know, we were on quarantine. It was kind of a, it was like a out of this, out of body experience in that regard. And it was very hard to, I guess, you know, just like have, have the same motivation to do things because everything seemed like it was crashing down. And obviously with sports, you know, sport, you know, because there weren't really a lot of sports going on for such a long period of time, it kind of made me get into different things. And it kind of made me, I guess, appreciate a lot in my life that, you know, like, even if there's not sports around, there's still plenty of good stuff that I have going on in my life and stuff that, you know, is fulfilling. And then like, obviously as like a sports communication, like major, like obviously you watch sports differently than the typical, just like sports fan. So like, what's your mindset? Like just watching, like, obviously like when you're watching one of your teams, like obviously like you're rooting, like you're watching the game as a fan, but I'm talking about just a typical game. Doesn't matter what what the sport is, but like what what's your mindset during the game? Well, I like to analyze stuff. I like to watch stuff very you know closely, like watching how like if it's football, like how does what kind of defense is the team running? What kind of offense are they running? You know, like plays. Like I love when they like break stuff when the announcers break stuff down. I'm also very curious since it is a we're talking about being communication majors. I am interested in like listening to the announcers, how they go about doing a game, even the halftime show, like the analysts, how they go about doing their job, stuff of that nature is something that I also take uh, a focus on because it's what I want to do with my life or in some semblance of that. So I, I care about it. And yeah, I, I guess I can watch the game. I watch games with a um, critical eye, you know, I, I watch them closely. I like to, you know, find things that other people may not find, you know, stuff like that and yeah i i don't i guess it's not i don't always watch games in a casual manner i think that's one thing at least for like for me like i always consider myself not not a typical person because i always look at things differently than most people i try to see both sides of an argument and i also look at sports more detail oriented where yeah i won't be taking notes but when it comes to sports everything's up in my head so that's one thing at least for me and then like moving on a little bit what would you say is like the biggest impact with you in sports? Like why, like, obviously you talked about like, why are you pursuing it? But like, what makes you like a person or something like that makes you uh, interested in being like sports, sports broadcasting, stuff like that. I guess it's just, it's the, uh, the, the, the fact that you can make a living talking about sports. You know, it's like, everyone talks about like, you know, having a job and like, you know, like some of them may even say it's not even a job if you, you know, you enjoy it. And I think that's a big reason why I want to get into sports. I want to do something that I love, something that I'm passionate about. And as I said before, talking about sports, you know, breaking it all down is very appealing to me. It's something I love to do and I've loved to do it for a long time. And I think I'm pretty good at it. And, you know, I, it's what I want to do with my life. And then this is more of like a personal question for you. What is one thing you want people to know about you? Hmm. It's interesting. Um, I guess that I'm passionate about sport. That I, about, I'm I'm passionate about sports. I'm hardworking. I, I, and I also I appreciate sports. 
uh, the history of sports. I've always been someone that like looked likes the old NBA, the old MLB football back in the day. I appreciate sports not just now, but even in the past. I think it's important to like think about well, how did things come to be? What was it like before all these things happened? You know, I think that's important. And I guess yeah, just passionate, um, eager to learn more. I'm always eager to learn more, and I'm e- always eager to look at stuff from a different perspective. And then when did you, like, obviously sports, like obviously being a sports communication major, like when did you find out like sports were interesting for you? Hmm. I think I first got into sports when I was in, I would say really interested in them about third grade because that was 2009 and the Yankees won the world series. And I kind of was just captivated by their run. I just, I was just, you know, I got hooked. That's how I got into baseball. That was the first sport I fell in love with. And that was in third grade. It was kind of just like being like watching the whole moment, watching it all happen, like how captivating it all was, was very fascinating to me. And I think that's how I got into sports. Then gradually, you know, I get into football the year after more, I get into baseball more the year after like stuff of that nature. I kind of just, you know, I grad or excuse me, basketball. I gradually got more and more into certain sports. And I just found them fun to watch, fun to play. I just, they, they just caught my eye. And then how, is, how have sports changed your life? Because obviously, like, you wouldn't be, like, in sports communication. We wouldn't be talking just about sports in general right now. Like, what has the impact had on your life? Hmm. I would say that the way that sports has changed or impacted my life has been the fact that it was kind of like me finding a passion. It was, it was finding something for me to fit in with people, something to talk about with other people, a way to socialize, you know, playing sports, talking about sports, watching sports, sports. They, all those things kind of helped me when I was younger, you know, meet new people, have stuff to talk about with other people and sort of find ways to fit in as best as I could because people, a lot of, so many people love sports. You know, you grow up watching sports, all these things, especially when you're younger, like as far as playing sports and it, it all kind of like um, came together. And I think all of that is why, like, I, I love sports because I think it's just, it's helped, it's given me purpose. And then like sports, obviously like having a big like impact on your life. When did you start to realize, like, I can pers- pursue like something in sports, in sports media, just like in general, like, Hey, like I'm going to college, like basically to study sports. Like, when did you realize, like, I can do something in the sports business? I think I first realized it in high school, probably my freshman or sophomore year was, and then junior year, I guess just, yeah, high school in general. Um, first few years, I think the more and more, like, I realized that this is what I want to do with my life. I can do stuff. Like I remember when I finally started writing for the school paper and my junior year writing about, you know, our sports teams or professional sports. I remember I, I'm like, I like this. I enjoy this. And that was kind of when I realized like, Hey, you know, when you get to college, like, you know, you have to be a sports communication major or just, you know, find the pathway that leads you down to what you want to do or, you know, which is sports com and like talking about sports, being an analyst, all these things. And yeah, high school was really when the, it was a pivotal moment in my life as far as like putting myself on a path forward. That's definitely cool to see. Like, how was, like, how is your high school different from others? Cause obviously like most public high schools or even private schools, Like, there's not a lot to do, like, with with sports. Like, obviously, like you mentioned, you were in the newspaper. But, like, what made, like, high school, like, make you pursue sports, if that makes any sense? Hmm. I would say that at my high school, Barcliffe High School, where I went to school, high school, obviously, there was a big emphasis on athletics. Athletics were a big deal. So, and being someone that was into sports, it was going to be a part of my life no matter what. So let's see, when I got to, when I was, let's see, when I was in 11th grade also, I started film, I became like the manager of my varsity basketball team and I was the guy that filmed the games. And I did that for my last two years of high school because it was a way to be around the team 
because I wasn't good enough to play on the team. So I said to myself, hey, well, you know, if you want to be involved, then this is a great way to do it. And even if that's not a sports communication thing, it's still something that keeps you involved in sports. So it was something that I wanted to do. I did a little bit with soccer my senior year, not as much, but I did do it. And writing for the paper, doing all these things, they kind of just put me on a path where I said to myself, all right, this is what I want to do. I I obviously want to work in sports. And, you know, my high school with the emphasis that it had on athletics, it kind of reinforced that for me. All right. So that's part one of this segment of Derek's discussions. Now we're going to go over to part two which is just discussing sports in general. Obviously, like we're going to discuss the three major sports, football, basketball, baseball, and then maybe we'll throw in uh, other topics as well. So obviously the NBA draft happened. Obviously, I know your team is the New York Knicks. Yeah, I'm repping them right now, as you can see here over the microphone. Uh, The Knicks in the draft traded their 11th selection. Uh, some guy from France, I yeah, believe. I U- Usman De- Jang, I think his name was. Yeah, okay. Usman so Jang. 11, yep. They traded him for three future, three conditional first-round picks. That ended up, those three conditional first-round picks ended up being a, all from 2022. All those picks were from 2022. Um, Denver was in there. Detroit. I think, no, I think it was 2020. Sorry. I think it was 2023. Cause it was. Yeah. 2020 this year. Yeah. yeah. So 2023, they were all, pro- they were all protected, all protected first round picks. Some were top, some were lottery picks. Some were top 12, I believe. And I think one was top 10, but at the end of the day, they get those three picks. Okay. They make that trade first. Let's talk about that trade. What are your thoughts? It was a weird night as a Nick fan watching everything with the draft go down. A lot of Nick fans, including myself, were clamoring for them to trade up to find a way to get Jaden Ivey, the point guard or guard from Purdue. That obviously did not happen, but there were still rumors from reporters that, oh, the Knicks were still finding a way to try to put together a package to trade for Ivey. So it was, a, it, it was kind of annoying because it was just like a false hope that didn't come to be, which always stings more, in my opinion. And as far as the Knicks... <laughs> I mean, I didn't study this draft that well. I, I, I'll be honest with you, I didn't. But, and, but part of me was just saying, like, what is all, like, my whole thing was, if we're going to make all these moves, dish, you know, with, for these picks to try and, you know, gather assets or so to speak, this better be for something good. It better not be just to, so we can make room for Jalen Brunson because that is not, that is not worth it. I'm sorry. I, let's listen. I like Jalen Brunson. He had a very pretty good year, but he is not worth breaking the bank over. I think we can all agree on that. I know that Tom Thibodeau hired his dad, Rick Brunson, who I who used to play for the Knicks as an assistant coach and has also been a coach. I honestly, people think that's because they want to lure Jalen to come to the Knicks. I think that could be part of it, but I also think that Tom, I know that Tom Thibodeau has a close relationship with Rick Brunson when Tibbs was an assistant with the Knicks in the late 90s, early 2000s. So I think that was also a part of it. But again, I just, I don't really understand what they're doing. It just seems like there's no plan. There's no rhyme. There's no reason. And I, I, you just kind of left, you know, stunned and you're left with, you know, what you can't find the words to describe it all because you just, you're in shock and you just don't get it. So that was trade one. That was just trade one, pick 11, all the way to get those three future first round picks. Then it's a three team deal. Some people, there was a lot of confusion on this deal in particular. So the Charlotte Hornets at, uh, yeah, Charlotte Hornets, because they didn't change their name just yet again, because, you know, they changed their name like three times already. But they pick the guy from Memphis, Jalen Duran, who is a center from Memphis. This is a guy where, on some boards for the NBA, the Knicks had they had the Knicks drafting him to replace Mitchell Robinson. So the Knicks somehow acquire him. They traded one of those future first round picks, those conditional first round picks, to the Horn to the Hornets. In that deal, that was a deal that happened by itself or in this three team deal. But that's with the Knicks and the Hornets. Then the Knicks traded Duran, Kemba Walker to the Pistons 
for a 2025 first round pick yeah. from the Met, which is from the Memphis. From the Bucks, or I think I think it was actually from Milwaukee. I think it was. It was either Milwaukee or Memphis. Yeah. That first round pick. That one was unprotected. So there's no protection on that first round pick. Now, when you look at it, the Memphis Grizzlies and the Milwaukee Bucks for the foreseeable future don't look to be still slowing down anytime soon. So you make that trade. Someone told me that was there was three trades because they said the Duran trade was two different trades, but that was all one trade and that was a three team deal. So tell me a little bit about the confusion in Knicks fans' minds about that trade, number one, and then just what's going on. I'm just is... I'm just confused. I, I can't describe it any other way. There's no other way for me to describe it. I'm just confused. I, I don't know what's going on. It's pure chaos. I don't get it. I, 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 I have more questions than answers, obviously. And I just don't get what the Knicks are. I, I, I was just confused. I just don't get it. I'm confused on what their, their end goal, their end game is, what their goal is. I'm just trying to think of what, what's the direction. Are they like loading up for free agency? Are they loading up to make some huge trade that we don't know about? Like, what is, what is it like? And I obviously we'll find out free agency is going to start soon, which means there's going to be a lot of wheeling and dealing. Um, with players going to different teams, staying where they already were, or trades that may occur. All of that stuff will be happening soon. So time will tell. Time will tell what the Knicks um, plan is. I will just say it right now. I don't have a very optimistic uh, feeling about them because why should I? Why should I? As a Nick fan, there's no reason I should be optimistic. They've been a disaster for almost my entire life. And unfortunately, I don't know. I, I don't see the tide turning. And then the, obviously the Knicks drafted a guy from Duke um, in the second round. His comparison is Amon Shumpert. Really? Yeah. So that's uh, who where, they where got. You, did that, someone who compared him to Amon Shumpert? That was on ESPN. It was the on the on the ABC broadcast. That was a comparison. Also, Bleacher Report sent something out for me, and the comparison was Amon Shumpert. So that's going to be uh, th- their second-round pick. Okay. I mean, it is a second-round pick. So, I, I mean, it's very – it's not – it's it's rare to find, you know, diamonds in the rough, if you will, in the second round. It's rare to find real impact players in the second round. That's not a common thing. So I'm willing to accept that. I, I don't really know. I mean, who knows if this guy's going to make the, the roster. He could be in the G League all year for all we know. So, you know, time will tell. You know, I, I the Knicks the Knicks didn't really give us give me at least a lot of reasons to be excited last night. I'll put it you know as blunt, bluntly as I can. What the Knicks did is they got three first round picks, uh, for pretty much the guy next from year. France. Yeah, next well, year. they got no, they got two for next year, and one for the twenty twenty five because they traded one of those uh, first rounders for next year. But at the end of the day. I don't know if you were watching the ABC or the ESPN broadcast, or if you were even watching the NBA. I, fl- I flipped back and forth between the two. I'll okay. It, but yeah. You should have put. Uh, did you see? First of all, this is this is hilarious. Did you see Spike Lee and S- Stephen A. Smith together? Um, <laughs> I saw. I don't know. I didn't watch the whole thing. I saw Spike Lee um, consoling Stephen A. Smith. I, I think it was after either the Knicks pick or Detroit took Ivy um, on Stephen A.'s Instagram. I, uh, you know, it's pretty comical. I, um, yeah, I, you know, th- those are the people that can, uh, I guess, represent the Nick fan base. Not all of us, but, you know, they are uh, the, two of the, I'd say they're two of the loudest voices, if you will, from the Nick fan base, especially for people that are uh, famous. Yep. And then Nick's obviously the guy that they wanted got drafted earlier in Jaden Ivey. They didn't know what to do at pick 11. There was talk that they, uh, well, Stephen A was wanting Johnny Davis. I even wanted Johnny Davis, the guy who goes to the Wizards in front of them. But at the end of the day, when I look at the New York Knicks, what their draft was, it wasn't like I get it. Like there's no hope in the New York Knicks. There's no point in even like hoping for anything because they have 22 picks in the next seven years, is what I was reading. That is 11 first rounders and 11 second rounders, but the Knicks don't know how to develop players. But at the end of the day, through other drafts that we've seen for the New York Knicks, they haven't drafted the right player at a certain slot. There was a guy later on in the draft. You obviously saw Frank Nilakina. They could have drafted Donovan Mitchell, other guys like that as well. But 
at the 11 slot, at the 11 slot, I did not see a guy where I was comfortable drafting them. So for me, getting three first round picks is actually huge. I understand why they did it completely. They wanted cap space, which you traded a guy in Kemba Walker, who personally, I love Kemba, but he's aging. He's old. He's hurt. It's not something the Knicks yep. need to be part of. I think another guy who could be traded, Alex Burks, Nerland Snowell, are guys who could be traded where they sign these guys, they re sign these guys to larger contracts than they deserved. And now they're paying the price. And the Knicks are looking to get Jalen Brunson. That's the end of the story. That is their guy. There's no real top free agents in this offseason. Mitchell Robinson's a free agent. Who knows what's going to happen there? Julius Randle, who knows what's going to happen there? But at the end of the day, if you get a point guard in Jalen Brunson, that's an addition, not a subtraction. That's huge. The Knicks finally get a point guard. The problem is $25 million a year for Jalen Brunson. That's not worth it. That's not worth it. Uh, I've been talking maybe Damian Lillard, Donovan Mitchell. Those are guys, but that's just not going to cut it. The Knicks need to develop guys, but What are your thoughts on this is a key piece for the Knicks right now? Because obviously people are saying he's a second best, he's a second best scorer, third best scorer on a championship level team. What do you think the Knicks should do with Julius Randle? I wouldn't mind them trading him. Um, He was, I mean, it it just stinks because, you know, he was most improved player two years ago. This year he regresses. He has a terrible attitude throughout the year. He seems disinterested. He's attacking the fans all the time. It was just a disaster all the way around from from the standpoint of Randall's season. I think that they should trade him if they get a good offer. I don't think – I think that they should definitely – if they get a call, they should listen. I like Obi Toppin a lot. I wouldn't mind them, you know, just, you know, having him take over Randall's spot if they trade him. Obviously, that is what would happen. And, yeah, I'm down on Randall. I'm not – I'm just – I'm not enthus- enthusiastic about Randall's future with the Knicks. It was really – he was very poor this year, and obviously you could tell because the Knicks did not make the playoffs after being a four seed the prior season. Yeah, I think that's the one thing is he had one good year. If you look at all of his other years in the NBA, he's a solid power forward. He's nothing too special, and Obi Toppin is not getting enough. Obi Toppin is not getting enough minutes for the Knicks. I think you trade. I definitely agree. I think you trade Julius Randle. You definitely look to move him. But one one last thing on the Knicks. Mitchell Robinson is a free agent. Uh, he's a restrict. I want to say restricted. He's restricted. Restricted free agent. So what are you thinking the Knicks should do? Personally, I would not pay him more than uh, my max would maybe be ten million dollars, if that, for a year. A year? Okay. May say. max ten million dollars a year. I think he's the next DeAndre Jordan. What are your thoughts? DeAndre Jordan in his prime. That's a pretty good player. Well, I'm saying like his top, like DeAndre top, Jordan. Like DeAndre Jordan like, is an all was an all star, all NBA, all the all defensive team player. I mean, if if Mitchell Robinson it's defense, I will. I don't think Mitchell Robinson is much of an offensive player. If Mitchell Robinson is half as good as DeAndre Jordan in his prime, I will be very happy. I'm just going to tell you right now, that's a pretty good NBA player. DeAndre Jordan at his peak, I know he wasn't a great offensive player, but he was a very effective player. He was a very good defender. And if Mitch Robinson can be like that, I am satisfied because it's not all about scoring. And as far as his contract situation goes, I think that I think 50 million, if in the 50 million range, 50 to 60 is the max in total. I would not. And again, if a team signs him there, the Nick, they could get into bidding more because the Knicks have the opportunity to match it. They have three days to match it. If he signs a contract with another team, because he is a restricted free agent, I think he'll stay. I'd be a little shocked if he left. I don't think that he's worth breaking the bank for, but I do think that he is young. He can still get better. And I think that for what he does, the Knicks could, you know, which is defense rebounding, score in the paint occasionally. I still think he's a valuable player, especially, you know, with it, especially because of how young he is. And if you can get him for a good price, then you should keep him. What would you say is the max per year you would give Mitchell Robinson? Because I was reading reports and people were thinking 18 million. You could possibly no. get 15, 18 million dollars because there's going to be a team out there who doesn't get DeAndre Ayton 
and they're going to go after Mitchell Robinson because if you look at the centers in the league, most of them are not that great on deep, great in the paint defensively. So that's one thing that Mitch has going for him. So how much would you be willing to pay him? A year, I'd say fifteen million. I'm okay with if it was like a you know fifteen million a year. That that, that I don't think that's outrageous, especially in today's NBA. It's not outrageous to give someone fifteen million a year, regardless of how good or good or bad they are. I think he's worthy of that kind of money. And I'd be okay with saying 15 million year. I would not go over. I would, if I, you go over that barely, 18 would be way too much. 18, anything in like seven, I would say the absolute max year would be 17. But as far as like the numbers would work, I think it'd be better if you paid him 15 million a year. I would probably would try to do like a three year, 30 million, but I'm not sure that would even, I don't think that would cut it. But at the end of the day, I think he's a solid, he's definitely a start, solid starter. I don't think he's going to be a guy that is going to be a like a number one, a number two, or a number three. I think he's going to be a solid starter uh, at center, but I don't think he's going to be anything special. I think he's just going to be a solid piece to have at the uh, five slot. Yeah, I don't disagree with you. Um, I mean, it'd be nice if he signed for that money, but I, I doubt it. And again, I think another team would offer him more than that. So getting him at that price would be, I think, almost impossible but I would like the Knicks to keep him. And then moving on, let's talk football. New York Giants. They're in an interesting, so- interesting spot. They have a quarterback that some pe- some New York New York Giants fans love. Some people who, can't. People love Daniel Jones? People love Daniel Jones. There are definitely people out there who love Daniel Jones. Well, then they're crazy. Okay, so obviously you don't, you're not a big guy. I mean, I mean Daniel he's Jones. all right. I mean – can you give me a reason to love anything about what's there to love about Daniel Jones? I mean, so this is what they say. He's got potential. And what they've said is over the last couple of years, he's shown the ability to limit. Obviously he still turns the ball over. That's not what they're saying, but he's limited turnovers and people are blaming the offensive line, which I get it. That's the offensive line has been crap, but you have to understand last year he had weapons. I think I'm so so on Daniel Jones. I'm not a hater. I'm not a lover. I'm in the middle. But I am too. before we get to specifically the New York Giants, big news came out. Big news came out. Arch Manning is going to Texas. You know yeah. I've talked about Arch. Oh, I know. I know how much you love Arch Manning. Um, it's interesting seeing him go to Texas. Texas is, I mean, I don't even follow college football that much, but I know that Texas has not been. Um, very good or a powerhouse like they used to be in a long time. I think obviously them getting Arch Manning, if he's as good as advertised, then that could really put their program on the map. So it's going to be interesting to see how he does, and especially in Steve Sarkeesian's offense. You know, Sark is an offensive guy. He's had his quarterbacks before. And it's and especially with um, Texas going to the SEC, which I think is a really, really bonehead, stupid move. I Texas wanna... doesn't go to the SEC till 2025, which would be Arches. I want to say sophomore or junior year. I think sophomore. Yeah. Yeah, but even that, even then, it's just I don't understand how you think. Let's let's you know build build back the program and let's make it harder on ourselves to do that by going to the SEC. I I understand money and I understand that's really the only reason they're doing it, but I mean, it just doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, you. You haven't won the when was last time they won the Big 12? That conference is not even close to as good as the SEC. And Maybe they don't even play they don't play years ago. They don't play defense in the in the Big 12 for crying out loud. They do in the SEC. So I I I don't know what the heck they're doing. I don't understand. I mean, thank God they got Arch Manning because I I just again I just don't get why would you want to go to the SEC? Like you're only making it harder on yourself to win. This is what I think they did to get to the SEC. I think they were – well, obviously, so they got Quinn Ewers as their starting quarterback, a guy from Ohio State. So I think he's a solid starting quarterback. I'm not saying anything, any praise for him. But if you move to the SEC instead of at the Big 12, the chances of getting Arch Manning were higher because they went to the SEC. You can say that the SEC was a stupid move, and I think it was a stupid recruit move. I think it was money. I think it was recruiting, and I think that they believe with Arch Manning as their quarterback, 
with the Quinn Ewers as their quarterback, with the ability of having a franchise type of quarterback in college, you can recruit other pieces to help on that defense. But the question is, does Arch stay? Because guess what? Steve Sarkeesian, if he has another five and seven season, is Arch going to stay? I don't know about that. Is Quinn Ewers going to stay? Then you got Quinn Ewers versus Arch. Texas is in a good spot if I'm the Texas Longhorns. I think the SEC was stupid. I completely agree on that point, but I think it's a recruiting basis. What are your thoughts on like what I've like said about recruiting? Yeah, I think I think that was certainly probably part of the reason they the stuff that you just outlined is why they probably wanted to move to the SEC. And you know, it makes sense recruiting, you know, money, all those things, viewership, you know, all those things would probably help if you go to the SEC. I still think though, if you're Texas and you want to win, I don't think that this is the this is a a great recipe for winning. I I just don't. I think that you're almost taking two steps back. Getting Arch Manning and having, you know, viewers to get from Ohio State definitely helps. But again, you mentioned, I don't think Sark is in any trouble for his job. I mean, how long has he been there? Uh, it's either, it was either his first season or second. I think it, I, I'm pretty sure it was his second season last year. Did they make a bowl? Did they have a bowl game? Did they? No, they, they were, they were five and I want to say they were five and seven. Hold on. I'm going to see uh, what Sarkeesian's record has been at Texas. I know he hasn't done anything special because of the quarterbacks he has had at uh, Texas, but he's been able to recruit guys at the quarterback position. So uh, he got hired J- January 2021. So he's had w- one season. He One season. It was only one season. Yep. All right. So, I, I mean, I, I think unless they're a disaster, I don't think he's – under fire and again like if he was a big part of why arch wanted to go there then they're not going to get rid of him that would just be a ridiculous move but again i mean yeah i mean i think that he has to win with arch texas just needs to they got to show improvement if they were five and seven last year they obviously can't do that again and you know and since they are they're not in the sec yet there's there's no reason why they can't you know do really well in the big 12. I mean, yes, you got Baylor, you have Oklahoma, they're in a new direction, but they're still Oklahoma. So there's stuff to work out there, but if you're Texas, you should, you know, there's no reason you shouldn't have a a improvement this season. I completely agree. The one thing I would say though, is Texas fans are very impatient and they have a lot of money. So with past coaches, at least from Texas guys have been kicked out. I'm not saying I'm not speculating anything that Sarkeesian's going to be fired but I was hearing, uh, I think it was, I want to say it was from Paul Feinbaum. Bomb, and I think he said he would not be surprised if Sark is out in three years because if he has another five, let's just say he's five and seven again, he's going to be in the hot seat. You just got Quinn Ewers, a star quarterback, five-star quarterback out of high school, went to Ohio State, and now he's at Texas. If you don't win with him, who are you going to win with? Their defense still stinks, but you got a top quarterback. You still got to get pieces. They still got other quarterbacks. Their quarterback from last season, Casey Thompson, transferred to Nebraska. That's going to be an interesting story there. But I think that's where it comes down is it depends on this year, and it depends on the year after that. I think Sarkeesian's a good football coach. Do I think I think he's the guy at Texas to give them the championship? Uh, I don't know. It depends on what type of pieces you get around Arch because Arch is one talent, but guess what? You're going to need receivers. Their O-line, though, I don't know if you've seen reports, their offensive line recruits for Texas have been getting better. So that's one thing to improve on definitely for this next season. I think with Texas, like you mentioned a a title. If if I'm Texas, win the Big 12. I mean, get to a bowl game, get in the top 25 consistently, and then you can start talking about a title. I mean, they need to get back to being a consistent winner before they can just, you know, skyrocket all the way to, you know, pandemonium. I just don't think it's going to work that way. And, you know, they kind of have to keep building this program under Sark. Hopefully it's under him. They can, you know, have one vision. And I think if they just, you know, stay on the track they're on, I think that they'll be um, better in the future. Yeah, I think getting the, obviously getting those two quarterbacks is going to help recruiting. And I think that's the main piece for Texas to recruit around those quarterbacks, because obviously, 
one quarterback's not going to do it. You've seen teams like Georgia. Let's be honest, Stetson Bennett is a starting quarterback in college. Is he anything special? Not no, necessarily. But they, won t- but they won the title. Exactly. You need pieces. You need pieces around the quarterback, no matter who your quarterback is at the end of the day. Yep. I agree. All right. Now moving on to baseball, MLB baseball, because obviously college is not as, not as, I'm not going to say not as important, but it's not as, not as riveting as uh, major league baseball. Cause obviously, you know, being at Marist college, their college baseball team is not, you know, at the level of college world series worthy type of uh, type of tier. But anyways, the New York Yankees have the best record in all of baseball. There's seven games ahead of the Mets when we're doing this uh, discussion right here. So what's going on? What are your thoughts on the New York Yankees? It's fun to watch. It's amazing to watch. Obviously, I am a Yankee fan. Derek is too. I'm not going to hide that, but I am going to try and be as objective as possible. The Yankees have been, they just seem rejuvenated. This is, it seems like this team has fun playing together. The Yankees for many years have been kind of boring. They've been kind of stale. They don't seem like they have a lot of fun. They lack swag compared to a lot of other teams. And it just seems like they've been rejuvenated this year. I think that I mean, it's. I mean, I, before the season started, I thought that the Yankees were not going to be very good. I think a lot of fans were, were upset that they didn't make any big moves for people like Carlos Correa, Trevor Story, Freddie Freeman, Matt Olson, et cetera. But Brian Cashman, his credit, made small moves that have worked. Getting Jose Trevino right before the season started has been a. That's my big, guy. Me too. I love him too. It's been a terrific move. Getting Isaiah Connor Falefa and Donaldson, who have added something different but have been uh, big contributors getting even Matt Carpenter in the middle of the season, you know, having an, an amazing week a few weeks ago, you know, and obviously the biggest one has been the fact that Aaron judge has put on an MVP level. He's obviously he's in a contract year. And I think he's well aware of that because he is off the charts right now. He's had an incredible year to me. He's, a, he's running away with the MVP as of right now in the American league. And he is in about to be in for a huge payday from either the New York Yankees or someone else, hopefully the New York Yankees. But again, the, the Yankees, they just, and the pitching has also been pretty stellar. Jamison Tyone has had a pretty, has had a improved season. Nestor Cortez, who nasty Nestor, as many of us call him, has been a revelation, has been something that no one really saw coming. Garrett Cole, who hasn't even been at his best all season long, is still having a good season. Luis Severino is finally back and healthy, and it seems like he. it's just great to see him out there on the mound consistently enough to worry about injuries. And then there's Jordan Montgomery, who is not a star by any stretch of the imagination, but has always been somewhat steady. He's always steady. He's relatively reliable. He's not going to wow you with anything, but he's not, but you know, he's steady. He just, you know, he's someone that can keep things calm. And Clay Holmes. Clay Holmes has arguably been the best reliever in baseball this year. He he had a stretch where he hadn't given up a run. It was, I think, gave a run opening day, and he hadn't given one up since uh, some game in the middle of the week. I think it was on uh, Monday night, if I'm not mistaken, against Tampa Bay. He had a long stretch where he hadn't even given up a run. So the Yankees are just, they're really clicking on all cylinders. This team does not have a lot of weaknesses, and they just keep winning games. Obviously, you mentioned Jose Trevino has been the key for the New York Yankees, as well as like the other pieces. Matt Comper- Carpenter came out of nowhere. That's a huge piece. And pretty much the Yankees got Jose Trevino for nothing. They traded him for Albert Abreu, Who's and they just got the him. And they just got him back on the team. And then you mentioned Judge. Judge has been killing it. Obviously, the arbitration hearing was supposed to be today. It didn't happen. The Knicks. The Yankees and Judge agreed on $19 million. They were $4 million in a gap. 17 Yankees were offering, 21 Judge wanted, and they split it right in half. Nothing like good old compromise. Perfect. Obviously, Joey Gallo has been Joey Gallo, as we shall say. He's but- been a disaster. I When you think of the weakest link on the team, it's, it's not even close. I, I, I don't – I. They need to move him or cut him or just some. I mean, I hear Yankee fans say, tell me, oh, he walks. Well, he strikes out, I think, almost 40% of the time. <laughs> think of it. That's, that's, that's almost <laughs> half. 
he strikes at almost every at bat, and you know it's coming. It's all, like I don't. I, he's just he's not worth the tr- the 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 trouble. I don't mean to say trouble, but he's not worth it in my opinion. And if you can get rid of him, if I'm Brian Cashman, do it. I mean, he's just not worth your worth it to me. You see, I don't see what he adds. Uh, Aaron Hicks had a big night. A couple. I want. It was last night, right? Or was yeah? It the well, night he hit the home run. Yeah, he, three he run, hit home home run run last night, and in the middle of the week, he had the triple late in the game against Tampa Bay. I think it was on the. It was a couple of days ago, where he hit the triple that got Donaldson home and kept them in the game. Or I can't remember if it was the Cole game or I don't know, forgive me for forgetting, but he has been better. The point is, Aaron Hicks has been much better of late, which is good because he's he got off to a really, really, really slow start to begin the season. And he's been, I guess, someone that the Yankee fans have gotten on, including myself, pretty frequently, uh, deservedly so. But it seems like he's started to turn a little bit of a corner. Hopefully he can keep that up. If he can, it would be a huge boost to the lineup. If Aaron Hicks can just be, you know, a middle of the pack hitter, not he doesn't have to be an all-star. He just needs to be, you know, he doesn't, he just needs to not slump all the time. If he can just put together good at bats and just hit the ball, you know, just put the ball, you know, in the outfit where the, you know, I want to say in play, cause you know, whatever, just put the ball in play, whatever. Just the point is he needs, he's playing better. And if he can keep it that way, it's a good thing for the Yankees, obviously. Definitely. And I've been a huge critic of Aaron Hicks, actually. Oh, me too. Me too. And I'm starting to like, I'm still a critic because I've never liked, like, I liked Aaron Hicks at first because, you know, he's a switch hitter, blah, 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 blah. He can hit. He he does things well, but he's hurt all the time. Now, is, yeah. if I'm the Yankees, contract. I still don't like him. If I'm the Yankees and you still don't like him, now is the time to trade him. I think you don't trade him, though. I think he's got value, and I think Gallo's the guy to go. I think Andrew Har is a guy where he's so disgruntled. Do you really want to? You either. I, I I think they should move him if they're not going to. I like Andrew Har. I feel bad to me, and I and I don't blame him for being upset at all. I think he has a right to be upset. You know, he keeps getting called down, and he's been solid. To me, if if the Yankees aren't going to play him, they need to move him and try and get something half decent for him in return. Unless you're going to play him, you're not going to play him. Then don't just keep him in the minors when he he's more than good enough to. He's too good for the minors. I'm sorry, he's not. He should be an MLB player. Like it's that simple. The thing is, Aaron. Uh, sorry, Miguel Andujar has been up with the team and sent down three times. The limit is five, so the Yankees have to keep that in mind. Number one, if they're going to bring him up again, and if they bring him down, I don't think the Yankees, if they bring him up again, are going to send him down. Because if you look at it, you bring him up, you send him down, then you're only with left with one more. You can't, you just can't do that. So I think at the, at the deadline, this is one thing the Yankees are going to do. It's either trade Gallo or trade Andujar. That is what they're going to do. If they can't trade Gallo and they can't really trade Andujar, they'll just release somebody. That's how the Yankees work. They have money. Anthony Rizzo has been good. Gleyber Torres has been good. Gleyber Torres, yeah, I don't mean to cut you Comeback Gleyber, player of yeah. the year. Well, I don't know about that, but he's really – he is someone that has really gotten better. I mean, it, it was weird because his first year, he was terrific, especially at the plate. Last year – the last, you know, two years, obviously we had the COVID shortened season, but then last season he really struggled at the plate and at shortstop, but it seems like him playing second base – has rejuvenated him not just in the field but at the plate. And he's never been a great fielder, but he is someone that he cannot, he's just not a shortstop. He's a second baseman. And it just seems like he's hitting the ball a lot better this year. And it's a good thing because when he is on, and he's also going big in big moments, people don't realize that all the time. Doesn't seem to be afraid of the moment at all, which is another great aspect of his game. And it's just good to see him playing like he used to. I completely agree. Obviously, third base is Josh Donaldson. I've never been a fan of Josh Donaldson. I don't like – I think he's a pain in the ass, but I think the Yankees need a pain in the ass in the clubhouse, and I think that's what's rejuvenated the Yankees just a little bit. Even though I don't like Josh Donaldson, but I think it's a good good pain in the ass to have. And then, obviously, Ky- Isaiah kiner Falefa has been one of the g- guys who Yankee fans have not were expecting him to be a stopgap for Peraza, for Volpe, for one of these guys. Right now, the way he's been playing, how is he a stopgap? 
This guy is a starting shortstop. I understand he's not a home run hitter. He's not a superstar, but this guy is very consistent. He can go out any single day. He will play great defense, which, let's be honest, the last couple of years, the Yankees have been very bluch at best on defense. And he's hitting. He was supposed to be a 200 hitter. He's batting like 260. Let me look up the stats right now. He's He's got to be batting at least 260. There's no way. Yeah, I, I, I don't know about 200. I, I think he's, he's always been a little bit better than that. But the thing with Connor Falefa has been he's stable. He's not a guy like Montgomery at, uh, as a pitcher, Connor of Falefa at short. He's stable. He, he doesn't have a lot of power. He still doesn't have a home run. And that's fine. That That's okay. There's no shame in that. The Yankees don't need 50 home run hitters. I think that's the problem. They've always wanted 1,000 home runs. They always want to lead the league in home runs. Well, it, who cares if you don't win anything? That's my philosophy. And he's been a big improvement um, on defense compared to what they've had at short in the past. And he just he just gets timely hits. And you could say, well, is he, he's not a stopgap. Well, to me, if Volpe and Peraza are as good as everyone says they're supposed to be, he's a stopgap. And that's fine. You know, that, so what this means, in my opinion, is that they don't have to rush Volpe and Peraza. They don't have to do that because if Kyner Fluff is still good, then why would you? You know, you can let them, you know, you don't feel the need to rush them to play at the pro level. Okay, so Kyner Fluff is hitting 269 with an on-base percentage of 321. That, I, I don't necessarily, I'm not the biggest guy on stats for a batting average. One stat I look at is uh, on base percentage. If your on base percentage is over 300, that's solid for a stopgap. A stopgap is not a guy who's going to have an on base percentage of over 300. The question is you talk about if Volpe and Barraza are the guys is advertised, you put them at shortstop and you quote him, and this guy is a stopgap. Well, guess what? What are you going to do? Where are you going to put this guy on the bench? I get well, it. He's versatile, and you got first base Rizzo for a couple years. He's his contract's only for a couple more years, so who knows with him? Donaldson's got two years left. Where would you put him if he's well, a stopgap? To me, I, I just think that you know they're going to have to make a decision on who plays, who doesn't. I I think that they're going to keep Rizzo past the two years. Hopefully, Lemay he has plenty a few years. Like I think four years or three years left on his deal and he can play first if they don't want to keep Rizzo for beyond next year. I, and again, we don't know if Connor Fluff is going to do this, play this good next year or the year after. Mm. That's all uncertain to me. And if he's still, like, you know, this is a good problem to have. You know, this isn't something that the Yankees should be worrying about. But again, I, I just think that's that's a bridge that they'll cross when they get there. Because again, we need to, like, you know, once that they're good in their uh, Peraza and full pay ready to play at the pro level, then I think the Yankees will. And I think this whole discussion is more worthwhile because it's like, you know, yeah. And then one thing is Clark Schmidt uh, got sent down. They brought up, brought up Albert Abreu. The reason for this is you're going to stretch out uh, Clark Schmidt. What is the, what is, what would you say your, what is the reason behind stretching him out? Number one. And then number two, do you see them having a six man rotation knowing that guess what? Nestor Cortez is probably not in an innings limit by any stretch of the imagination, but he hasn't pitched that many innings in a while. Uh, Tyone's been hurt in the past. Severino has been hurt in the past. Montgomery and Cole are probably your only two starters that I can say, Hey, they can give me innings and I'm not too, too concerned. Yeah. I I don't think they're going to go to a six man rotation. I don't think they should. I don't think there's any reason they should, if they've been this good with the five man rotation all season long, why would you change it? If it ain't broke, don't fix it. You know, that's my philosophy. And I think that's the philosophy the Yankees should approach the rest of the season with obviously if there's injuries, then there'll be people to fill in for those guys. But with that not being the case lately and so far, then I don't think there's anything worth tinkering with. And then who's your sleeper sleeper pick for the New York Yankees. That's not talked about as much as they should be. Hmm. And that's how we're going to end it on this uh, discussions. Okay. Uh, hmm. So that's not been talked about very much. It's, It's tough because like this whole roster has been, you know, put on, you know, been spotlighted the whole year. 
I just think, to me, in all honesty, I just think that the fact that, like, people, Torres, from the standpoint that people don't realize how brutal and how much, how maligned he was last year. Like, he was really, like, going through it. And I think this year it just seems like he's not a, he's a positive to the team now. And that's a really reassuring thing. I also think Rizzo has been really, he's been, uh, you know, up and down, but like his power is like, he's taken advantage of the short porch and right field more than anybody that I've seen in recent memory. And his power has gone way up. And I think that he's played pretty stellar defense. I think he's a leader of the team. I think he's one of like the guys that they love in the clubhouse. And I think he's a, a good voice to have around. My guy would have been Mike, Michael King. Yeah, he's definitely up there too. I think he's, and Ca- I think Castro, not as much a little bit lately, but especially in the early half of the season, he was really, really good. And I think considering that they gave away Jolie Rodriguez, who has not been as good, and getting Castro in return was another great move by Brian Cashman. Yeah, I think at the, the at end of the day, the New York Yankees are looking to being good. Obviously, they're going to have pressure coming up, but at the end of the day, they're they're still in a good spot. Yep, I agree with you a thousand percent. And Jacob, thank you for joining me on Derek's Discussions, Episode 2. Appreciate it. No problem. Thank you.